All right, so happy Father's Day, everybody. I know, um, you know, often people preach on Father's Day on Father's Day, but I just felt like I've, I've preached a lot of practical sermons over the last couple of weeks. So today I'm preaching on a topic I've been looking at a bit and thought was interesting because I don't really hear much on the topic of the laying on of hands. So today's not going to be so much of a of a practical sermon, you know, an encouraging sermon. We're just looking at the different examples of laying on of hands in the Bible. And now there are different ways that the laying on of hands is used. And it was interesting because when I mentioned laying on of hands, Alex said to me, are you preaching on ordination? So some people have an idea of what the laying on of hands is as opposed to it's being used for different things. So there's three things I want to talk about today on how the laying on of hands is used. But let's just first look at Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6 says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. So in Hebrews 6, 1, it mentions some of the principles or fundamentals of the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Uh, so it goes into here saying, hey, leaving the principles or the fundamentals of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. So it's not laying again the foundation of, and then now he mentions a few principles of the doctrine of Christ. The first one is repentance from dead works. Now, this is not repentance from sin. A lot of people think it requires repentance from sin in order to be saved. No, it doesn't. It's repentance from dead works, the Bible says. So what's the difference between dead works and sin? Well, sin is when we break the law, but dead works is when we are trusting works to get us to heaven. Uh, I've heard it explained this way, and it's, it's really good that a dead faith is when you have faith without works, and dead works is when you have works without faith. And that's why the Bible's saying here, one of the foundations of salvation is that we repent from dead works, which is when people are trying to work their way to heaven. You know, they're trusting their baptism, their, their church attendance, their Bible reading, you know, their charity, their giving, whatever. They're, they're good works uh, rather than putting their faith in Jesus Christ, which is God. So there's the repentance from dead works. And that's often what, what false religions are. Right? They're trusting in their dead works because a lot of false religions teach that you have to trust you know, your good works. You're working your way to God as opposed to God coming to us and saving us. So that's one, which is obviously salvation, repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Yes, of the doctrine of baptism. So there's different baptisms as well, right? Because there's the baptism with water and there's the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Look at this, and of laying on of hands. So did you know that the, lay, the doctrines of laying on of hands is a principle, the doctrine of Christ, but often it's not really talked about much, right? And then it says, and of the resurrection of the dead. So not only Jesus Christ rising from the dead, but us rising from the dead and of eternal judgment. So hell being an eternal punishment is one of the principles of the doctrine of Christ. And he says, and this will we do if God permit. And then it goes on to the other things he's teaching in Hebrews 6. So the laying on of hands is a principle of a doctrine of Christ. It's one of the, one of our, of the fundamental doctrines, um, even though it's not one that's really talked about that much. Now, what is the laying on of hands? Now, the, I'm just going to teach you tonight what I understand about the laying on of hands. And, and maybe people have different understandings. But from my study through the scriptures, I'm sharing with you what, what I've learned and what I, uh, how I understand the laying on of hands. So the laying on of hands is obviously when you lay hands on somebody and then perform some sort of act. And we'll look at three different acts in the Bible. And what I believe the laying on of hands is, it, it signifies like a transfer of something. Right? So it's sort of like an a, a, like a actual physical way. You know, like we take the bread and the cup and they all have a different representation of what they mean. The laying out of hands is, is used as a visual cue where a transfer of something has happened. So we're going to look at three different things that gets tra get transferred in the Bible when the laying of, on of hands is done. So the first one we're going to look at is, is a transfer of blessing. A transfer of blessing. And this is more so for prophets in the Old Testament when they would bless or curse. You know, And, and often blessing is transferred through uh, somebody putting their hands on somebody and blessing them. And the example we see in the Bible is of Jacob. So it says here in Israel, so if you didn't know, Israel is, is Jacob's name as well. It, it was when um, God renamed him Israel. So Israel is Jacob. So we see Israel here 
blessing the sons of Joseph. So Joseph was the one that went into Egypt that we read about when we were reading through the Psalms. Um, and he had two sons, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh. So let's, uh, let's see here the laying out of hands in this situation. Israel beheld Joseph's sons and said, who are these? Right? So if you remember, Jacob thought that um, Joseph had died. So now he's seeing him in Egypt, he's ruling in Egypt, and he's just so happy to see him. And he's saying, I, I, he's not only happy to see Joseph, but he's also seeing Joseph's children. He says, who are these? And Joseph said unto his father, these are my sons whom God hath given me in this place in Egypt. And he said, bring them, I pray thee, unto me, and I will bless them. So Jacob, as a prophet as well, because a lot of these Old Testament fathers, they were prophets of God as well. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Um, now the eyes of Israel, so Jacob, were dim for age, so that he could not see. And he brought them, and he brought them near unto him, and he kissed them and embraced them. So I'm sure those of us that have little children can understand that, that sometimes when you see a little child, you know, you just want to hug them and kiss them, especially if they're related to you, like your own. I, I'm not really a children person. You don't really see me hugging and kissing other people's kids, but I hug and kiss my kids, right? And they're very like, no, I'm just like hugging and kissing them. And, and I, I bet it's probably the same. And one day I'll be a grandfather, and, you, and uh, maybe that emotion is even stronger because because you know, now you know, you maybe, maybe you regret that you didn't hug and kiss your kids that many. So you see your grandkids and grandparents are just, you know, they love their grandkids so much. So you can imagine what Israel's thinking, right? He's seeing his grandkids, especially of, of his favorite son. Not that it, it's right to have a favorite son, but Joseph was um, one of his favorite. He had the coat of many colors. Uh, and Israel said unto Joseph, I had not thought to see thy face, and lo, God hath showed me also thy seed. So he says, I didn't think I was going to see you again, and now I'm seeing my grandchildren, you know, your children. And Joseph brought them out from between his knees. So they're quite small, right? And he bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both. I don't know if you've ever noticed this in this story. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand, toward Israel's left hand. And Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand, right? Because the reason why he's doing this, right, is because Manasseh is his older son. So you've got Manasseh and Ephraim. So he's holding Manasseh in his left hand and Ephraim in his right hand because he wants to present his children to Israel so that Manasseh is on Israel's right hand and, and Ephraim is on his left hand. Does that make sense? And Israel stretched out his right hand. Look at this. So remember, who's in front of, who's in front of Israel's right hand? Manasseh. Right? But he stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, and who, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head. Right? So if you imagine, he's actually like this. I guess he's crossed his hands, right? Because they're the other way. Guiding his hands wittingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, so now he's got his hands on his two children, but he's blessing Joseph, which is the father, said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life uh, long unto this day. The angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, so with the children, let my name be named on them and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. So this is the passing on of the blessing of Abraham. And, 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 and Isaac did the same. Remember when he was tricked into blessing um, uh, um, Jacob, right? Which who's doing the blessing now instead of Esau, his, his older brother, his twin. And when Joseph, look at this, Joseph now, which is the child of Israel, saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased, it displeased him. And he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father, Not so. My, not, and Joseph said unto his father, he's speaking to Israel now, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. And he blessed them that day, saying, In thee shall Israel bless, saying, God make thee as Ephraim and Manasseh. So notice how when he says, God make thee as Ephraim and Manasseh, he said Ephraim first. And he set Ephraim before Manasseh. Now, why did he do that? I'm not too sure, right? If you know the answer, you can tell me. Maybe it's because, you know, he was the younger, 
right? He was the younger of Esau and Jacob, and he sort of, you know, uh, bought the birthright from Esau, and he had to, his mother had to trick, you know, uh, Isaac into blessing him. So maybe when he blessed the children of, of Joseph, he, he switched them, right? And he blessed the younger over the elder, just as he was, um, even in the womb, said the elder shall serve the younger. But we see here, it, it, we see the, the hand of him and, he, and that transfer of the blessing. So that's the first laying on of hands that we'll look at tonight. Now, the second one is the transfer of spiritual gifts. So this is the one that, you, you know, if you think of the transferring of the Holy Ghost or the transferring or the using of spiritual gifts, you know, what comes to mind? The Pentecostals, right? Now, the Pentecostals have taken this to a, a whole different level and totally taken it out of what I believe the Bible teaches. And maybe I'll teach on that ne next week in terms of, you know, spiritual gifts and, and um, whether, whether they've ceased or not. But just to give you a summary, I, I do personally believe that spiritual gifts have ceased. I believe spiritual gifts have ceased. Now, I don't think that necessarily means that uh, miracles don't happen anymore, you know, or visions don't happen. I do think it's possible. I mean, God can work in any way he wants, right? So, you know, people say like in heavily Muslim countries, for example, where maybe the gospel is really dark there, where people have been visited by a light and Jesus has shown himself to him. So somehow, right, like, am I going to write that off and say, no, it's not possible? No. But that has nothing to do with spiritual gifts, right? Like the spiritual gifts are the things that were given by the Holy Ghost, you know, to the apostles, and they would lay their hands on people and pass on spiritual gifts. And those are the spiritual gifts that are talked about in 1 Corinthians 12, where it's like learning, prophecy, you know, tongues, and, and we'll look at some of those. So I believe those gifts have ceased with the ones that were given by the apostles. And now that the apostles aren't around, there's nobody to give any more spiritual gifts. But I don't, I don't necessarily think that means that miracles don't happen anymore. You know, and miracles can happen. Can people still get healed? You know, we can ask God to heal people. People can still miraculously get healed. I think the difference is that their people don't have the gift, the spiritual gift of healing, where they would lay their hands on somebody and heal somebody. Um, like the Pentecostals think they have, you know, Benny Hinn, you know, he thinks he's got, you know, the, the, the spiritual gift in his coat, right? You see those videos where he's like spinning his coat and people are just like falling over. I find it really funny when people make those videos and then they add like fireballs to them and like people are just like falling over. So those guys, I think, are, I, you know, who knows what's going on. Some people think when it comes to Benny Hinn and stuff, it's just all an act. You know, that's uh, some people's testimony. Is some of it satanic? You know, I'm sure there's a bit of satanic demon possession going on. So I'm not discounting that there's a spiritual realm because there is the realm of spiritual, uh, you know, the, the satanic world and occultism and all that sort of stuff too. We're talking about the spiritual gifts that were given at the day of Pentecost through the apostles and, and, and continue on. I believe that ceased. And, we'll, and I'll talk about why I believe that in a moment. So first of all, we, we see here not only the laying on, I've, I've made it the transfer of spiritual gifts because I had it the transfer of the Holy Ghost, but it's also the gifts given by the Holy Ghost where people would lay hands on people to use the spiritual gift that they were given. So we see here in Acts 28.8 uh, where the laying on of hands was used to heal people of that had the spiritual gift of healing. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux to whom Paul entered in. So Paul is an apostle, right? And he had some spiritual gifts. And prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So we see there, they're the laying on hands. So this is a transfer uh, or using of that spiritual gift to actually heal somebody. Um, not only that, but this is the context, I believe, of Mark 16, where you know, it says that these signs will follow them that believe. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, now, we often use that passage, and I don't think it's necessarily wrong to do this, to say, hey, this is the Great Commission given to us. But I would sort of prove it from a different point in the sense that this, these are words specifically spoken by Jesus Christ to the people that, that were there who were going to get the laying out of hands and receive spiritual gifts, and these are the signs that would follow them. And then we read in the New Testament where Paul exhorts us to continue that work. So I do think this applies to us you know, indirectly as Paul taught us, but 
I, I, but I think to, I, we need to understand this passage in the sense that Jesus is talking actually to a select group of people and saying, hey, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And then we continue their work. But we don't necessarily get all these signs that they saw when there was this transitional period of the word being confirmed. So Mark 16, 15 said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved and he that believeth not shall be damned. So we were talking with some Mormons today and people will say, well, that means you need to be baptized with water to be saved. No, because that verse shows that the only thing that condemns you is that you don't believe. So yes, um, there are two ways you can understand this. Either, either it's just, yeah, if you believe and you are baptized with water, of course you're saved because you believe. And if you believe not, you'll be damned. I personally think the right interpretation of this passage is that the baptism referred to here is the baptism of the Holy Ghost that we see through the book of Acts. And he's saying that those that believe and receive the Holy Ghost are saved. And those that don't believe obviously can't receive that Holy Ghost um, in, this, in this period to these specific early followers. And these signs shall follow them that believe. So these are where the miracles happen and the spiritual gifts, right? In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. And they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any, any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So I know I'm touching on a few other things, but really I just wanted to show you this passage because um, we saw Paul laying his hands on, using that spiritual gift he had to heal people. We see here the disciples saying, the early disciples, that if they were to receive these spiritual gifts, these signs would follow these early disciples, they would be able to lay hands on on the sick and they will recover. Now, why in the Bible do we only see where the use of spiritual gifts with the laying on of hands, with healing people? And I was thinking about this and, and then I looked at 1 Corinthians 12 where it shows us the nine spiritual gifts that are given by the Holy Spirit in this early period. And, and in 1 Corinthians, you, you read about these spiritual gifts because in the Corinthian church, there were people that had received a lot of these spiritual gifts, right? Because Paul was there. He laid his hands on them, gave them these spiritual gifts, and they were abusing them, right? Like some of them had the gift of tongues we read about in 1 Corinthians 12. And instead of using it for the edification and preaching of the word, they were just using it just to, 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 to edify themselves, to show that they had a gift, but nobody understood what they were saying. Right? It's like if I came here and I just started speaking in Swahili, right? And nobody here understood Swahili and I'm preaching the word of God. I mean, I'm not edifying you guys. I'm just lifting up myself, showing you guys that I can speak another language. So he's saying that they, were, they were abusing these, but they had these spiritual gifts in the beginning because they knew an apostle, right? They had Paul lay uh, his hands on them to give them these spiritual gifts. But why is only the gift of healing the one where they're laying on of hands? And when you look at these spiritual gifts, it's because it's the gift of healing is really the only one that requires you to do something to somebody else where the laying on of hands is. Uh, that may be the case. But look at these spiritual gifts here. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. So this is the reason why spiritual gifts are given. It's not to edify yourself. It's to profit other people, right? It's to, it's to be used to serve other people for to one is given by the spirit the word of wisdom right so to another the word of knowledge so wisdom is the right thing to do knowledge is just knowing more things so you don't really need to lay your hands on anybody to have that gift right by the same spirit to another faith right so some people have more faith than others right by the same spirit to another the gifts of healing so that's the one we see in the bible where people are actually healing other people and laying their hands on them and having that actual visual cue to another the working of miracles to another prophecy to another discerning of spirits so this is i think discerning of spirits is like knowing whether somebody speaking the word of god is actually of god or not to another diverse kinds of tongues right so you don't need to lay your hands on somebody to speak with another language and to another the interpretation of tongues so one is to be able to speak another language and another is to be able to understand somebody else's language and it'd be interesting i wonder if there are some people yeah I, I don't know if it happened right i wonder if uh you know you could speak another language but you couldn't understand it as well and people would have to work together <laughs> i don't know it'd be kind of weird if you could speak a language but you didn't really understand it uh but we don't really know how all these worked right now another thing we knew is that timothy um had a spiritual gift that was given to him but but we, nobody really knows what it is 
right? Now, I, I don't know whether it was really the gift of healing, unless you had a gift of healing and you couldn't heal yourself, because Timothy had infirmities, right? When Paul said, drink it no longer uh, water, but drink a little wine for your stomach's sake, and often infirmities, um, you know, if he had the gift of healing, could he not just heal himself? You know, um, I'm not sure exactly how these spiritual gifts work. Um, you know, maybe you can only heal other people, but not yourself, because Paul also had an infirmity that didn't go away, or a thorn in the flesh. Uh, so my point is here that Timothy had a spiritual gift. So not only is the laying on of hands a, a symbol of using a spiritual gift, but also to, to be given a spiritual gift. So it says, neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, look, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. So what is the presbytery? The presbytery is the government of the church. So he, he was probably had his hands, he probably had the laying on of hands on him by several, some of the apostles and was given a spiritual gift. And it's funny that Tim, uh, Paul is saying to Timothy, don't neglect that gift. So it's saying that they could be given a spiritual gift, but may not use it. And maybe they don't use it for the right reasons or they neglect to use it for the glory of God. Maybe they take it for granted. You know, and, and it's similar to maybe how we have a talent right so they may have been given supernaturally a gift but you may have a talent and the bible can can apply to you here and say don't neglect that gift don't don't forget that that gift that you have that talent that you've been given is meant to be used to serve god not just to serve yourself kind of like the, the gift of tongues in the corinthian church they didn't just give them the gift of tongues just to serve themselves right you, you know you're given the gift of tongues so that you can go and be a, a world-class translator no, no, you're given the gift of tongues so that you can preach the gospel to people in the tongue that you've been given, right? That's, that's why, it's to serve God. It's the same with our talents. Our talents are there to serve God primarily, secondarily to make a living for yourself, right? So if you're good at a certain task, primarily it's to serve God, right? Just like Bezalel in the Bible. Bezalel could make all manner of furniture and tap, you know, tapestry and all this sort of stuff. But the reason why God gave him that wisdom is so he was used to build the tabernacle. Now, Bezalel probably made a good living, carpentry, doing all sorts of stuff, right? But was that why he could do those things? No. He could do those things so that he could serve the Lord with it. Acts 8 is a really, uh, uh, gives us a lot of insight, I believe, into the laying out of hands and the giving of the Holy Ghost and the giving of spiritual gifts. So we'll just read through this and then I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a couple of things that, that I've learned from this passage. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. So this is the early church because of persecution, um, especially from, uh, from, from, uh, from Paul, the apostle, when he was Saul. They were scattered abroad, right, because of this persecution. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. So if you don't know who Philip is, Philip is one of the early deacons of the church. Uh, the two that are most famous are, are Philip and Stephen. You know, Stephen was stoned in the previous, previous chapter. And now we have Philip going about his missionary journey down to Samaria, preaching Jesus Christ. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. So Philip had a spiritual gift, right? Even though he was a deacon, he probably, he would have had his, his, the laying on of hands on him to receive a spiritual gift, right? So he's there in Samaria performing miracles. Who knows what he's doing, right? We're given some insight here into what he's doing. But it says here, for unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with him and many taken with palsy. So palsies are like you're par par paralyzed in some way or another. And that were lame. So lame might be other, another, maybe a physical disability where you're not able to walk as opposed to a paralysis, uh, were healed. So here, I guess, uh, uh, Philip would be in Samaria preaching the gospel, laying his hands on people, healing people. So the gift of healing was not only physical healing, lame and people with paralysis, but also people with unclean spirits. So the spiritual healing as well, where people may have uh, be demon-possessed. And that's the reason for their infirmity. And there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria. So sorcery was like dark art, dark magic or trickery and things like that. Bewitching the people as though he had some power of God, even though he didn't. Giving out that himself 
was some great one to whom they all gave heed. They all listened to Simon, right? They all gave him respect, right? Because he had, he bewitched these people with his sorcery he was doing from the least to the greatest saying, this man is the great power of God. And to him, they, gave, they had regard because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. So that's what he's doing. He's, he's there preaching the gospel, doing miracles and, and baptizing them. And we see later in the name of Jesus Christ, because that's the name that's being emphasized here, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. Now underline this to show you that Simon the sorcerer got saved, right? By listening to Philip's preaching. He heard the preaching, he saw the miracles, and he also believed, right? And he was also baptized, right? And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done so this is philip exercising those spiritual gifts he's been given simon believes and we know that he got saved he wasn't just faking it because it's the author of acts the author which is the holy ghost in acts 8 13 telling us that simon believed so we know he believed simon believed he was baptized and he's beholding the miracles and signs which were done now when the apostles which were at jerusalem heard that samaria had received the word of god they sent unto them Peter and John, right? So the apostles in Jerusalem hear that Samaria, people in Samaria are getting saved, right? So they send Peter and John. Who's Peter and John? They're two of the apostles, right? And I don't know if you know this, there's more than 12 apostles, if you didn't know that. So an apostle is anyone that's ordained by Jesus Christ and sent. There were the 12 that were with him. Uh, Judas was replaced by Matthias in, in amongst the 12, but he sent 70 others also, right? So if you're not sure that there's more than 12 apostles, just think there was the 12, Judas died, Matthias, and then you have Paul, right? Paul's 13 already. You got Barnabas, who's an apostle, is 14 already. So there's more than just 12 apostles, but there's the 12, which is 12 of the apostles that are, have a sort of higher standing than the other apostles. So they, I think they have a bit more authority, it seems like. They're like pillars in the early church. They sent unto them Peter and John. So they're, 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 they're in the, they hear of the people getting saved in Samaria, right? So then they send Peter and John down to Samaria. Who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Um, for as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, then laid their hand then laid they their hands on them and they received the holy ghost and when simon saw that through laying on of the apostles hands the, the holy ghost was given he offered them money i'll come back to those passages we'll just read through this verse saying give me also this power that on whomsoever i lay hands he may receive the holy ghost and peter said unto him thy money money perish with thee so he's saying your money is going to perish and you're going to perish too because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. See, if somebody believes that the gift of God can be purchased or worked for, then they're going to perish, right? So this is saying here, you know, you have to receive the gift of God by grace, not by buying it or working for it. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness. So a lot of people use this passage in 8 to teach that you need to repent of your sins to be saved. So we see here that, remember Simon the sorcerer, he was already saved. He was already baptized. So this is a, this is a, a, a quote to a believer telling him to repent of wickedness, right? Because we as believers ought to repent of our sins, but we don't repent of our sins to be saved. That's work salvation. So he's telling a believer, hey, repent of this wicked thought, because Peter doesn't know that Simon is saved, right? They've just come down to Samaria and Simon's tried to offer them money after he's seen them laying hands on and giving people the Holy Ghost. So he's just saying, hey, you're going to perish. You think that you can buy the gift of the Holy Ghost with money. You know, you, you perish with, with, with that. So he doesn't know that he's saved, right? He's just saying, hey, you need to repent of this wickedness um, and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. So he's saying like, you know, you may not even be saved if you're thinking you can buy the gift of the Holy Ghost. 
Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which he has spoken come upon me. So he does instantly repent of, of that wicked thought, right? And he's praying, when he says, None of these things which he has spoken come upon me, saying that he's going to die, right? Or he's going to perish. Uh, but he's saved. And, and they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. So what are the two things I want to point out in this passage? Let's go back here. The first thing is, um, you know, we believe here, or I believe, uh, you know, and that's why this church does it, is that we baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and that's how we, we understand Matthew 28 correctly, is that Jesus Christ um, has the authority of the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost because he's God manifest in the flesh. And we see here all throughout Acts that the name of Jesus Christ is being preached and they're baptizing people in the name of the Lord Jesus, right? They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, some people to get around this doctrine, right, that, that these, are, these are the words we ought to be saying and glorifying when we baptize somebody in water, they say that the bap baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus, this is how they distinguish the two. They'll say, well, baptism in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost is water baptism, but baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus is when you are baptized with the Holy Ghost and the laying out of hands and they receive the Holy Ghost. That's baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus, as opposed to when you baptize them with water, it's I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Now, this passage, I believe, proves that baptism of the Holy Ghost is not baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus. Why? Because it says right here, right? Because remember, he was preaching the name of Jesus. They were baptized, right? And then they sent for Peter and John that they might receive the Holy Ghost. And then it says here in verse 16, For as yet he, the Holy Ghost, was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So you see how they were already baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus because the water baptism was baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then when they came, they baptized them with the Holy Ghost, right? When they laid their hands on them. So that's one thing. This uh, another one is in Acts 19 here where we see Paul, when he meets these disciples that had never even heard of the Holy Ghost, right? So he gets them saved. He baptizes them in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then it says here, and when Paul had laid his hands upon them. So after he's baptized them in the name of the Lord Jesus, then he lays his hands on them and the Holy Ghost came on them and they spake with tongues and prophesied. So another example where baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus is not the laying out of hands and giving of the Holy Ghost. It's the water baptism because the disciples understood correctly what Jesus told them in Matthew 28, that he had all authority. Therefore, go and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost because the name of Jesus Christ has the authority of all because he's God manifest in the flesh. That's the first thing from Acts 8. The second thing I wanted to show you was this. And why I believe spiritual gifts have ceased is because I don't believe, um, I, only, I only believe that an apostle, somebody who was ordained and sent by Jesus Christ himself, has the ability to pass on the Holy Ghost, right? The spiritual gifts that are given by the Holy Ghost, right? But somebody who has received a spiritual gift of the Holy Ghost cannot pass that on to somebody else. That's what I believe. And the reason why I believe this is because in Acts 8, Stephen, uh, sorry, Philip had the spiritual gift, right? And he was laying, his hand, he, was, he was exercising that gift. He was healing people, casting out devils, doing all sorts of miracles, right? But why did they need to send Peter and John down to Samaria to, part, to give other people spiritual gifts? Because Philip wasn't an apostle, right? He was a deacon. But the apostles had to come to Samaria and then they laid their hands on people to give them spiritual gifts. So I believe what we're seeing here is you, you can be given a spiritual gift, like Timothy had a spiritual gift, and Paul's telling him, hey, don't neglect that gift that was given you. But I don't believe Timothy had the ability to pass on the Holy Ghost to somebody else. That's why Stephen couldn't. Oh, sorry, I keep saying Stephen. Philip didn't here. Because if Philip had the ability to give them the Holy Ghost and give them spiritual gifts, why didn't he just do it when he was in Samaria? No, the apostles had to come down, right? And that's why Simon, when he sees, he says, Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, right? So there's something unique about the apostles. Otherwise, what, I mean, what would make them different, right? It's sort of like they're given something special that other people don't. So the apostles had something different. And um, this is why he, you know, because if, if, anybody 
who was given a spiritual gift could just pass them on, why didn't Simon try and bribe Philip? Right? Because if Philip's there in Samaria, healing people, giving other people spiritual gifts, wouldn't Simon go to Philip and say, hey, I'll pay you, you give me that gift. It's not until the apostles come that now he's seeing something different. He's like, wait a second, these guys are able to impart spiritual gifts. And he offered them money to try and get that power, right? And when Simon saw that through lay laying on the apostles' hands, uh, it was given, he offered them money. And then he says, thy, thy money perish with thee. Look at what he says here in verse 21. Uh, uh, sorry, verse 19. Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. Verse 21, Peter replies to him saying, thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. So I think what's happening here is, is because Simon thought that the gift of the Holy Ghost could be bought with money, Peter didn't even give him a spiritual gift. Do you know what I mean? It's just like, you, don't, you, don't, you think you can be bought with money? You're not even going to get a spiritual gift to use um, for God's glory uh, because his heart wasn't right. It's was probably because he wouldn't use it right. I don't know. So that's why I think spiritual gifts have ceased um, because I only, I only believe the apostles can pass on this gift but you, once you have a gift, you can exercise it, but you can't pass the gift on to anybody else unless you're an apostle, and we no longer have apostles because apostles are not just a lineage of people like the apostolic Pentecostals believe that they just pass on and they're apostles and they're apostles and they're apostles. No, apostles are the ones that were specifically chosen from God. That's why when they're trying to replace Matthias, they can only choose from certain people. They're choosing an apostle to replace Judas. Matthias was chosen, and there were certain people that they could choose from. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, we see here where Paul's writing to the Corinthians, truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. So there's something different about what an apostle can do to what just somebody with a spiritual gift can do. Because if he's saying here truly the signs of an apostle, then what are the signs of an apostle if Philip, who's not an apostle, is also having the signs of an apostle? So that's why I think there's something unique. And what I believe it is, and what we see from Acts 8, uh, and I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, but it's that apostles can only pass on the, the spiritual gifts, but those that have received the spiritual gifts can't pass on the, the spiritual gifts. All right, let's look at the last one. The last one is a transfer of authority. And this is the one we're more familiar with because this is one that's more applicable in the New Testament, which is the laying out of hands to appoint somebody or ordain somebody. And this is the one that uh, Alex was uh, alluding to when we spoke earlier. The transfer of authority. So we'll go through this one uh, quickly. Numbers 27 is the first instance where we see this when Moses lays his hands on Joshua not only to give him a spiritual gift, but to ordain him as the next leader of the congregation of Israel. And Moses spake unto the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation. So that's the same thing when we ordain somebody and we lay the hands on them. It's a transfer of authority. We're ordaining them and appointing them into a position. We're setting a man over the congregation, which may go out before them and which may go in before them and which may lead them out and which may bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee, Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thine hand upon him, and set him before Eleazar the priest, and before all the congregation, and give him a charge in their sight. So this is very similar to what happens in the New Testament, where we lay our hands on something, we appoint them into a position, and we give them a charge in the sight of the congregation. And thou shalt put some of thine honor, honor upon him that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. So it's a visual cue to the congregation to show, it's a testimony to say, hey, this person is being given authority that you would respect that authority that has been given to them. And he shall stand before Eleazar the priest who shall also counsel for him after the judgment of Urim before the Lord. At his word shall they go out and at his word they shall come him in, both he and all the children of Israel with him, even all the congregation. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and he took Joshua and set him before Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation. And he laid his hands upon him and gave him a charge as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. So we see there the laying on of hands. 
to transfer that authority. But not only that, I believe because Moses was a prophet, he also transferred to him a spiritual gift in, in that laying out of hands. Because in Deuteronomy 34, 9, it says here, And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. Right? So he received a spiritual gift even back then, for Moses had laid his hands upon him. And the children of Israel hearkened unto him and did as the Lord commanded Moses. Look here in Acts 6, where we see the appointing of the first deacons in the early church. It says here, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, who we may appoint over this business. So they're just the admin work of the church was getting too much and thousands of people to minister to. So they decide, hey, the, the apostles um, can't handle all this anymore. So then they get some, some deacons appointed who we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So we see here that is the need for deacons in a large church, a need for even the church to help out because we see here as the apostles are starting to get bogged down with the administration it's taking them away from prayer and from the ministry of the word what's the ministry of the word the preaching of god's word right teaching and preaching and the saying pleased the whole multitude and they chose stephen um, that's the one that died in Acts 7 a man full of faith and of the holy ghost and philip we talked about in acts 8 and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and pa uh, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid, excuse me, they laid their hands on them. So you see here, here is not necessarily a giving of us. Because these are apostles ordaining them and giving them authority and setting them over that business, you know, at the same time, this is when they may have received their spiritual gifts. Because it's after Acts 6 that then they go out, right? Stephen's preaching in Acts 7, Acts 8, you know, Philip's going and doing all the miracles. So it might have been at this point where they actually received their spiritual gifts. Acts 13, we see here again where people are ordained and, and appointed to positions of authority. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and si Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and uh, Manaean which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So you see here, there's like a, a transfer of authority or an appointment to do a certain work um, to send them away. And that's why I think there is, there is a sort of a structure here amongst the apostles because, you know, these guys were apostles and yet the apostles prayed and fasted for them and, and sent them away. Uh, 1 Timothy 5, let the elders that rule well. So this is one that's more applicable to us now because we don't have apostles anymore and prophets. We just have uh, bishops and deacons. Let the elders, so the elders are the bishops. I believe elders is just, a, is just synonymous with, with bishop. And obviously it's also used just for older people, but when it talks about the actual uh, officers in the church, I believe it's just interchangeably used with bishop. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. So I'm just reading from verse 17, just so you can see the context that this is talking about the leadership in a local church, the, the elders, the bishops. For the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. So this is just saying that the, the bishops should be, should be um, provided for, and they should obviously have a paid position in church. Church should provide their salary. Against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. So again, you see the context is bishops, right? The fact that bishops are provided for, the fact that if you hear something about a bishop, you should not receive that accusation unless there are two or three witnesses. Them that sin, rebuke before all that others also may fear. Now, I think this is what applies to bishops as well, especially people who are of religious leadership they ought to be publicly rebuked because they have public offices with spiritual influence. So here he says here, so remember when we looked at Moses, that you lay your hands on them, you give them a charge. This is the transfer of, of, of authority. In 1 Timothy 5.21, we see here the charge given to Timothy, right? I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. 
Now, the reason why I've outlined, hey, the context is the bishops, it's this authority structure within the church. He's charging Timothy with, you know, keeping and being faithful to the work. Now, when we get to verse 22, this is why I believe this lay hand suddenly on no man is about the transfer of authority and not the transferring of spiritual gifts. Because again, we've already talked about the spiritual gifts not being transferable if you received it from somebody else, from the apostles. Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partakers of other men's sins, keep thyself pure. So he's charging him to continue in the work, right? Uh, before all these people, but he's also saying lay hands suddenly on no man. So what does he mean by that? Is that we just don't appoint people to positions of authority just willy-nilly, right? They need to fulfill the qualifications, prove themselves, and then we, we don't do it suddenly, right? We do it carefully. And this last verse, and this is where I'm going to finish, is just Acts 14. And this is why when we, uh, when I've ordained somebody in the past, this is why we did it with prayer and fasting. You remember when we ordained Kevin? Um, we, we had a night where we, we didn't have food, right? We came together, we prayed, and we fasted, and we ordained Kevin into the position of a bishop. Uh, but this is why, right? Because the Bible says in Acts 14, 23, and when they had ordained them elders in every church, so this is where the Apostle Paul's traveling around now, and he's appointing people to positions of authority, he says, and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed, right? So once you appoint somebody to the position of a bishop, now they're accountable to God, right? You commend them to the Lord on whom they believed. So like I said, tonight's sermon, not really a, um, a practical sermon. There's some practical things we can learn from the passages. But I wanted to just give you a rundown of how I understand the laying on of hands. So if you remember the three examples we saw in the Bible, the first one was uh, the, the transfer of a blessing, right? The second one was the transferring of spiritual gifts and also the use of those spiritual gifts in laying on of hands. And the last one we see is the transfer of authority where people are ordained in the local church and put in positions of either um, a bishop, which is an overseer, or a deacon, which is like a, more a servant, somebody who does more administrative tasks rather than teaching and leadership. All right, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord, uh, for your word. And um, thank you that we've been able to learn a bit more about this principle of the doctrine of Christ, the laying out of hands. And I just pray, Lord, that you would just continue to teach us through your word. Pray, Lord, that people were edified tonight. More of a doctrinal sermon tonight, but I pray that the Spirit would speak to people here and that there are just practical things that they can apply in their lives. And um, even if it's just understanding this better so that when they talk to Pentecostals or when they talk to people about baptism in the name of Jesus or how the Holy Ghost works and spiritual gifts, it would just give them more ammunition and under, a better understanding of what we see in the Bible. So thank you, Lord. We just pray that you will bless the rest of our time here. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.